So the idea here when it comes to a more resilient mindset is to recognize that our outer world is a reflection of our inner world. It's a perception based on how we feel. If we're feeling very in sync, very in flow, kind of more positive, things tend to look and feel a little bit brighter than when we are in a depleted state. I'm your host, Anna Malikian, and before we start with today's show, please remember to visit Mindset.zone. Yes, instead of .com, it's .zone. There you can find all the episodes and other amazing resources, all at Mindset.zone. Today, we have as our special guest, Vered Kogan. She's the host of the Mindset Game podcast, and she's also a speaker, coach, and trainer, and the founder of the Momentum Institute. She's truly an avid learner with certifications in a series of different modalities, including, but not limited to, the heart math, neuro-linguistic programming, timeline therapy, hypnosis, EFT tapping, and rapid transformational therapy. And here we are going to be speaking about resilience. So welcome to the Mindset Zone podcast, Barrett. Thank you, Anna. It's wonderful and exciting to be here. Yeah, and it's always a pleasure speaking with you because I think we always learn from our conversations. And I would love, because this topic of becoming more resilient is so important in general, and especially in the day-to-day with so many changes that are happening in our lives and in the world, that I would like to start by asking your definition of resilience. Yeah, absolutely. So I subscribe to the definition that the Institute of HeartMath uses for resilience, And the Institute of HeartMath is a research institution that studies the communication between the heart and the brain and kind of how do we access that state of optimal performance and optimal health. So they define resilience as the capacity to prepare for, as well as recover from and adapt in the face of stress, challenges, and really any adversities that we may experience. So The key words there are not just kind of to recover from and adapt in the face of stress, right? Kind of like this idea of bouncing back when a setback happens in our life, you know, getting back up and, 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 you know, being very persistent and so on, but it's also to prepare for. So that's one of the things that a lot of people don't know, that there are things they can do in advance of stressful situations uh, to really prevent that accumulation of stress so that they can respond uh, much more easily, quickly, and in a kind of higher way, right? In a way that they would feel good about. Um, and, you know, we can talk about some ways to do that if that would be helpful. That will be great because I really like these, the nuance that you are doing here because usually when we speak about resilience, the term in itself comes, I think, from physics, of the, the materials that they have, the resilience of bouncing back. An elastic band is the classical example that we stretch it and then it goes back to its previous size. And that is the resilience capacity. And that is uh, the direct relation that we many times take to, okay, there is a crisis, a situation, and are we resilient to come back, to bounce back? The, And at the same time, the richness of human beings is this capacity of learning. First, we can bounce back better and learning from things. And you are adding this so important dimension that we can prepare ourselves for the constant changes that we face uh, to allow us to be more resilient. Yeah, the the metaphor that I love to use um, is one of a battery. Right. So if you imagine kind of an inner battery, almost like, uh, you know, the battery on our cell phones or our cars. Right. So when you think of resilience as the amount of energy that you have stored in your inner battery, 
right? Basically the energy that you have available to use, not only physically, um, you know, but also of course, mentally and emotionally. So when the battery is pretty full, right? Because you utilize certain techniques, you, you've built some resilience in your body. So when there's a high level of resilience, kind of a more fully charged inner battery, if you will, then you have a better capacity when stuff happens to remain calm, to be able to think clearly to make better decisions, essentially be in control of your emotions so that no matter what happens, you can stay composed, not overreact to things, um, especially when you're dealing with very challenging people or challenging situations. You can kind of just roll with the punches, so to speak, just be in that state of flow rather than get really stressed out or overreact or make a bad decision, um, which can really kind of further drain your um, your inner battery right drain your energy so when <laughs> yeah i i love the metaphor that the image that you are using of the battery uh, and even we are carrying around our phones all the time mm-hmm. and uh, most of us charge our phones at night because we mm-hmm. need the full charge for the next day i like that the, the image that is something that we have to do uh, is a practice that we have to do and even during the day, it's like if our phone is getting low from batteries, very we are very aware, oh, we have to do something to recharge it. That's right. Because may, maybe we need it and we have to have some charge on it. And I think it's so healthy for people to think about that in their own reserves. Do I have, how can I resar- recharge my mental battery uh, in a daily basis and even within the day to be ready when the situation requires me being in my best. Absolutely. Because if the battery is not full, right? Because think about it, we're kind of energy systems. So we wake up with a certain amount of energy um, and then we, you know, basically expend energy, right? We spend it, we use it. And then we also do some things to renew our energy, right? Physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. But when the battery is depleted, then there isn't energy for us to draw from, right? When we when we need it, right? So it makes it really hard to be at our best, whether it's, you know, when we are with our family or maybe when we're presenting at work or making decisions or uh, really just going about our day, right? We, we are not able to respond as well as we'd like in those tough and sometimes, uh, you know, kind of very demanding situation. So, and it can affect also the people around us. So the idea here is to keep your inner battery as full as you can. And I'll kind of share some ways to do that soon. Uh, And when you do experience a leak, right? So someone says something, there's a trigger, right? You just kind of, the the battery seems to be depleting very quickly, right? We want to do is kind of plug that hole, so to speak, put it, you know, charge it back up so that we don't get left with an empty battery because that's when we feel totally exhausted, fatigued, we're overwhelmed, we we don't have energy to do anything. So it's really important to pay attention to our energy throughout the day. And when we are in that deplete state is when we go back in many ways to previous patterns that sometimes are not the best ones. And is when we are more in the reactive mode uh, and the more in the fear kind of negative emotional uh, fe- uh, f- uh, fooled by uh, the scarcity of the situation and the threat of the situation, that is a narrow way of being and thinking instead of more expansive way if we have the, the battery charged. That's right. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Are you, I'm going to do a little detour here um, because I'm curious and then I would love, I, I, my, I listen to you that you are going to say that you are going to do something, give us some tip, practical ways of recharging the battery. So you will go back there for sure. But I'm just curious if you are familiar with the, the positive intelligence program of Sirjad Jamin. I am. Because in the app, he uses the same metaphor of the battery that I really love. And it's a lot about the small exercises during the day to recharge our battery and to keep it in the green. Exactly, I think, because of the same principles that you are describing. Yes. So um, 
I am familiar with with that methodology, and I think there are many wonderful, wonderful gifts. Um, I think as it relates to resilience, it's important, I believe, to uh, view all of the parts of us um, in a very compassionate way. Um, so I personally don't subscribe to the concept of saboteurs. Um, I believe there are maladaptive behaviors, but I believe that they are little parts of us that were especially, you know, essentially frozen in time in times of trauma. And so when it comes to resilience, it's really important to pause throughout the day and label how we feel, uh, really acknowledge and accept all of the parts of us, right? I feel angry. I feel, uh, I'll give you, what, may I give you a, a quick example? Yes, please. So one of the um, new clients that I'm starting to work with, he shared with me recently that he sold his company um, and, uh, you know, was under the impression that when the company was being sold, that he would stay on for a little bit in an advisory role and it would be kind of a transition plan and it didn't work out to be that way. So he essentially woke up one day with, in his words, no purpose, no uh, you know, nothing to wake up for, right? The whole identity was gone. Also, many of his friends were as part of that, that he was now kind of detached from. So there was a lot of grief, right? Any change is essentially a form of grief. And so um, as we were kind of exploring that, like, how did you feel, right? To kind of see those parts. And he said, you know, what I really feel is abandoned. And it was kind of, it took him by surprise when that word kind of came out, because he'd never really consciously thought of that. But even just labeling how we feel reduces some of the charge kind of in the amygdala, right? It kind of just, it's very soothing. And what happens is that then there's kind of more energy going to the front part of our brain so that we can think more clearly. Um, so I believe that we really need to accept all of the parts of us, including how we feel, and to give a whole lot of love and compassion. I think that's what builds the most resilience capacity. I absolutely agree with that. One of the uh, the skills that we have to develop is being gentle with ourselves. And uh, I like always, and I, I have even an episode here in the Mindset Zone podcast that is all about, is it, I think the title is Negative Emotions Can Be Good because mm -hmm. it's not the, they are not bad in themselves. It's what we do with them. If we stay stuck on them, that creates uh, issues and challenges. In themselves, they bring information that is important to listen and um, um, to, like you're saying, label and uh, uh, allow us to check what is going on with us. Oh, yeah. Every emotion has wonderful gifts. Wonderful gifts. Yeah. And so we want to get the gift. And as you said, then let it go, not to keep that energy in the body. And the one thing I think that you speak about in terms of really resilience is that different dimensions of different uh, types of resilience, correct? Yes. So, um, you know, again, the, when we think of resilience, not just as, you know, bouncing back and you know, recouping from kind of challenging things in our life, then it's really important to consider how we can prevent those stressing situations, stressful situations as much as possible. So one way to do that is to build a resilience capacity uh, to be even more coherent. And there are four domains of resilience, uh, four domains, doorways, if you wish, through which we can uh, be more flexible and uh, increase our resilience. So one of them is physical resilience, which many of us think of, right? When we think of like working out, right? More endurance, more strength, that kind of physical flexibility. There's also the emotional flexibility, our ability to have a more positive outlook, our ability to self-regulate our emotions, right? To label them and then shift and reset as we're going to learn how to do in a few moments. Uh, there's also kind of spiritual flexibility that is all about values, our commitment to those things that are most important to us. Are we honoring them or not? Are we honoring other people's values and beliefs? And then, of course, the mental flexibility, you know, our attention span, our ability to focus, to incorporate multiple points of view. But right there in the middle of all of those four domains is the word coherence, mm -hmm. the word coherence. And that really is uh, what I referred to earlier when I talked about that state of optimal performance, when all of our body's parts 
uh, body systems are communicating harmoniously, uh, synchronistically, and then the body is able to function at its highest and best. So tell us a little bit about, because yeah, the four domains I think people can visualize. We have the physical resilience, if we are physically fit, um, we can even, it's like if we climb a set of stairs, we still arrive at the end of, uh, at the top of it with energy to do something and not just, okay, I'm now sitting here and not moving. So there is that physical capacity as that help us to face things, the emotional, emotional flexibility, emotional recovery. I think uh, people also can see that. I love the spiritual about the values to be aware how um, we can develop uh, our reserves and, the, um, and our strengths at that level. The mental resilience uh, in terms is really uh, developing high performance could be a way of seeing it, correct? Yes. And uh, the uh, that in the same way, uh, going back to the physical, it's almost if we are mentally fit, uh, we are able to deal with more difficult situations uh, still without losing our mental breath, so to speak. Yeah, it's a synchronization. What I want to understand well, because you say the coherence that is in the middle of this is what brings things in alignment. So speak a little bit more about to that concept. Yeah, so coherence really is this kind of state of ease of synchronization. So I often like to explain it through the metaphor of a high performing rowing team. So if you imagine a rowing team, right, there's somebody at the front and that person is saying stroke, stroke, stroke. Yes. And as that person says that everybody in the rowing boat dips their oars in the waters at the exact same time, right? There's a synchronization. There is you know, kind of a, a, everybody's going at the same pace and that boat just flies, right? There is less resistance and it's the same for the body. So when we're in a coherent state, it's when our, our mind, our heart, our emotions are all in a state of uh, harmony, almost like a beautiful orchestra is another mm-hmm. metaphor that we could look at. And I imagine, Anna, that there are times when you've experienced, right, like t- being totally in sync, right? Things are flowing. There's that sense of ease. Maybe there are some challenges that come up, but you know, when you're in that coherent flow, things just don't get under your skin quite as much, right? The things that would bug you normally, let's say, might not really disturb you as much. So when you uh, have that state of uh, balance between the heart and mind and the emotions, the body, everything is working together. We're kind of able to take charge of ourselves and maintain our composure in those challenging situations because we just have more energy. Time just seems to you know, fly by. Everything just seems so easy, right? We lose track of time. And so you know, we can think more clearly. And then we've all been there in those times where it's the exact opposite, <laughs> Right. Or like no no ideas are coming to mind. We stare at the same paragraph for, you know, 20 minutes or, you know, the words aren't flowing. We don't know the right thing to say, or maybe we say the absolute wrong thing to say, you know, so we've all been there. And, and it's just a matter of our state in that moment, because when we are in a state where we're experiencing more pleasant or what we call regenerative emotions, right, what some of us might call positive emotions, we have uh, different uh, patterns going on uh, in our body, right? A different what we call heart rate variability pattern going from our heart up to our brain, up to the thalamus in our brain, which controls all of those wonderful thinking kind of executive functions, you know, and when we are incoherent, when we are experiencing some depleting emotions, some stress or anger or uh, frustration, sadness, you know, all the kinds of emotions that we experience typically during a change, then, and we're not, you know, managing those emotions in some way to stop the leak, so to speak, from our inner battery, then we have an incoherent signal going from the organ of our heart up through the autonomic nervous system, you know, the vagal nerve to our head brain. And so what that means is that our body's not functioning. We're neurologically inhibited from accessing the right decisions from uh, kind of taking the best action in that moment. So, So the idea here when it comes to a more resilient mindset is to recognize 
that our outer world is a reflection of our inner world. It's a perception based on how we feel. If we're feeling very in sync, very in flow, kind of more positive, things tend to look and feel a little bit brighter than when we are in a depleted state. So how do we go about cultivating that? Great question. So one of the things that's important is to begin to tune in to how we feel throughout the day. Um, so, you know, maybe pausing four times a day to just kind of pause and say, hmm, how am I feeling right now? And there's some great apps that could be used for that. Uh, one of them is called the Mood Meter. I guess. So M-O-O-D Meter, M-E-T-E-R. That's a fantastic one. A lot of my clients like to use that because it, it helps to uh, really give a name to what we're experiencing on the inside. Many of us have a very limited uh, number of words for feelings because we just have not been trained. So it expands our vocabulary and really helps us to fine tune to what is it that we're actually experiencing right now. Is it frustration? Is it irritation? Is it annoyance? Is it anger? What, what exactly is that, for example? And once we label it, we want to set an intention. Well, okay, if this is how I feel right now, right, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, wherever I am, how do I want to feel, right? Do I want to choose to feel something that's a better feeling uh, emotion or perhaps to sustain how I'm feeling right now or maybe even intensify how I'm feeling? Let's say if I feel confident, do I want even more confidence or even more enthusiasm, for example? And so that is kind of really important just to build that rapport with uh, our heart's intelligence, you know, with our unconscious mind, um, and to help us to become more tuned into uh, different um, changes throughout the day in our energy, right? We can kind of become less numb to what's going on on the inside. Uh, many of us are so conditioned to experience stress that we don't even notice, notice it. Notice that, we, yeah. yeah. So is that, so the the checking in to see where we are, the intention or what we want to do uh, with that awareness and? Correct. The intention more of how we want to feel. So labeling that word of, of how we want to feel. And then to do, uh, I recommend uh, the uh, quick coherence technique. It was developed by the Institute of Heart Math. It is so super simple. You could teach it to a little five-year-old. Um, please, please don't allow the simplicity to fool you. It is very, very powerful. There are literally hundreds of peer-reviewed uh, research studies validating um, the, uh, you know, the, the effect of this uh, particular technique. Um, would you like me to kind of go through those two steps and maybe even guide your listeners through it? And guide me here. Love that. I just <laughs> want, I always like to do it because I know that people listen to podcasts everywhere. If you are driving or something that demands your attention, you can do this later time. So always be safe and use your best judgment, but please guide us here and I will be here also doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Anna. And what's really exciting about this particular technique, where it differs from a lot of other techniques that are more mindfulness techniques, this is a technique that could be done anytime, anywhere. So it, it can be done, of course, with the eyes open, with full concentration on driving or walking down the hall or being in a meeting or being at the dinner table, um, because it's something that does not require us to... Um, to uh, really shut down what's going on around us. It just allows us to synchronize what's happening. So I'm going to describe it and then we can uh, do it together. So the first step is that we want to focus our attention in the area of our heart. And it often helps, especially when we're first learning this, if we can and it's safe to do so, to take our hand and actually place it over our heart or chest area. And once we do that, then we imagine, yes, we kind of do some pretending. We imagine that our breath is flowing in and out of our heart or chest area. And as we do that, we breathe a little slower and a little deeper than usual. So we're going to be breathing in and out of our heart, kind of finding a nice, easy rhythm, something that feels comfortable, not forced in any way. 
just kind of a nice rhythm, imagining the breath flowing in and out of the heart. So that is called heart-focused breathing. So then the second step of the technique will be that once we continue to focus our attention in our heart, we make a sincere attempt to re-experience a regenerative feeling. So what is a regenerative feeling? Essentially, it's any positive feeling, anything that makes us feel good, such as appreciation or care for someone or something in our life. So often it helps to try to re-experience the feeling that we have for someone we love, maybe even a pet, or kind of imagining going back to a special place, like a place in nature that makes us feel good, or maybe uh, re-experiencing a moment of an accomplishment, or even just focusing on a feeling of calm and ease. So the idea with this step is really just going to be to activate a positive feeling. And it does help to imagine being at a time when we felt really great, right? Kind of like to flow right into our body, imagine being there, looking through our own eyes, seeing what we saw, hearing what we heard. So um, do you have any questions about that before I guide us through it? I, I'm already there, but the, please keep going. Cool. So go ahead and focus your attention in the area of the heart. Imagine your breath is flowing in and out of your heart or chest area, breathing a little slower and deeper than usual. Find an easy rhythm that's comfortable. And as you stay focused in the area of the heart, make a sincere attempt to experience a regenerative feeling, such as appreciation or care for someone or something in your life. And when you're ready, if, if your eyes are closed, I invite you to open your eyes and we can come back to our conversation. Thank you. This is just wonderful. I absolutely love breath work. I think is we have to be breathing to be alive <laughs> and just the, the bringing the awareness to our breath and these little simple, but like you say, powerful techniques and exercises are really something that can shift a lot of uh, our mindsets and uh, um, the res increase our resilience. I totally see that. Um, and uh, in in the art mat, they also have an app that you can use to train some of these breathing exercises. I remember at least some years ago they had uh, an app that had a sensor that we call attaching the finger or in, even in the ear uh, for mm -hmm. the heart rate variability, correct? Absolutely. So um, what you're referring to is called the inner balance sensor. I'm happy to send you a link for that uh, after the show. And uh, if your listeners were uh, having that sensor on their finger, or on their ear, for example, that measures their heart rate variability as they were doing that technique, um, if they access a heart feeling, then more than likely they would see their coherence levels rising in real time um, because heart rate variability is the best measure for that. And so they would see in real time, how am I feeling? Because the body does not lie. Yeah. And it's great for tracking. And it's great, as you said, for building our resilience capacity, because as we practice this quick coherence technique, uh, we recommend about three or four times a day. Um, to kind of check in with how you're feeling and to use the quick coherence technique. Once a week, add in an extra 15-minute session 
um, to kind of change some of the maybe underlying kind of baselines a little bit more. Um, but when you do that, what's going to happen is within as little as five or six weeks, you're going to notice a pretty significant shift in how you are feeling. You're going to feel a lot more ease, uh, a lot less stress. Uh, you're going to feel less tired, more energized, uh, less anxious, worried, unproductive, and just more of your higher best self. Um, and so, yes, absolutely. That's something that's uh, available to anybody listening. Love it. And I will make sure that I will put all these resources in the show notes for this episode. And uh, I know that you share your wisdom and uh, a lot in speaking, a lot in training your organizations. Can you tell us where we can find more information about that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking. Uh, MomentumInstitute.com. That's the name of the organization. And we offer uh, virtual trainings, in-person trainings, uh, individual and group uh, to help people build their resilience capacity. Because what we know is that individuals and teams can adapt much quicker and easier to change when there is a higher resilience capacity. They're also more intuitive. Uh, they're able to access more in, you know, innovative ideas, more creative ideas in that um, higher, uh, kind of more resilient state. So um, yeah, happy to, uh, to share that with you as well, because I believe that uh, this is about being very mindful of our own energy. So when we want to influence people on our team, influence our children, our spouse, right, to feel better, right, to to help them access their own resources. It starts with us. And it starts with us managing our own energy, right, using that quick coherence technique to really be in that more elevated state, radiating more of that higher energy, more elevated energy out into the field around our body, allowing others to feel uh, more in sync, more ease as well. And so we have a responsibility uh, to help ourselves and to help those around us by managing our own resilience capacity, making sure our battery is as full as it can be. Is becoming more resilient can be as simple as becoming more aware of our breathing and doing these exercises in to recharge our batteries. Love it. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Keep spreading the, the amazing work that you are doing uh, with individuals, companies, and with your speaking all over. Uh, it's really wonderful to have this opportunity to speak with you. And I'm so glad that you are here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anna. All my love right back to you. And thank you for all the wonderful things that you are doing for our world as well. Expanding possibilities, the Mindset Zone. Thank you for listening and remember to visit Mindset.Zone. Yes, instead of .com, it's .Zone. There you can find all the episodes and other amazing resources, all at Mindset.Zone. As always, I'm so grateful you are here. Expand what's possible for you, for the ones around you, for the world. <laughs>